Chapter One of the War That Will End War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The War That Will End War by Herbert George Wells. Chapter One. Why Britain Went to War. A clear exposition of what we are fighting for. The cause of a war and the object of a war are not necessarily the same. The cause of this war was the invasion of Luxembourg and Belgium. We declared war because we were bound by treaty to declare war. We have been pledged to protect the integrity of Belgium since the Kingdom of Belgium has existed. If the Germans had not broken the guarantees they shared with us to respect the neutrality of these little states, we should certainly not be at war at the present time. The fortified eastern frontier of France could have been held against any attack without any help from us. We had no obligations and no interests there. We were pledged to France simply to protect her from a naval attack by sea, but the Germans had already given us an undertaking not to make such an attack. It was our Belgium treaty and sudden outrage on Luxembourg that precipitated us into this conflict. No power in the world would have respected our flag or accepted our national word again if we had not fought, so much for the immediate cause of the war. But now we come to the object of this war. We began to fight because our honour and our pledge obliged us. But so soon as we are embarked upon the fighting, we have to ask ourselves what is the end which our fighting aims. We cannot simply put the Germans back over the Belgian border and tell them not to do it again. We find ourselves at war with that huge military empire with which we have been doing our best to keep the peace since first it rose upon the ruins of French imperialism in 1871. And war is mortal conflict. We have now either to destroy or be destroyed. We have not sought this reckoning. We have done our utmost to avoid it. But now that it has been forced upon us, it is imperative that it should be a thorough reckoning. This is a war that touches every man and every home in each of the combatant countries. It is a war, as Mr. Sidney Lowe has said, not of soldiers but of whole peoples. And it is a war that must be fought to such a finish that every man in each of the nations engaged understands what has happened. There can be no diplomatic settlement that will leave German imperialism free to explain away its failure to its people and start new preparations. We have to go on until we are absolutely done for, or until the Germans as a people know that they are beaten and are convinced that they have had enough of war. We are fighting Germany, but we are fighting without any hatred of the German people. We do not intend to destroy either their freedom or their unity, but we have to destroy an evil system of government and the mental and material corruption that has got hold of the German imagination and taken possession of German life. We have to smash the Prussian imperialism as thoroughly as Germany in 1871 smashed the rotten imperialism of Napoleon III. And also we have to learn from the failure of that victory to avoid a vindictive triumph. This Prussian imperialism has been for 40 years an intolerable nuisance in the earth. Ever since the crushing of the French in 1871, the evil thing has grown and cast its spreading shadow over Europe. Germany has preached a propaganda of ruthless force and political materialism to the whole uneasy world. Blood and iron, she boasted, was the cement of her unity, and almost as openly the little, mean, aggressive statesmen and professors who have guided her destinies to this present conflict have professed cynicism and an utter disregard of any ends but nationally selfish ends, as though it were religion. Evil just as much as good may be made into a cant. Physical and moral brutality has indeed become a cant in the German mind, 
and spread from Germany throughout the world. I could wish it were possible to say that English and American thought had altogether escaped its corruption. But now, at last, we shake ourselves free and turn upon this boasting wickedness to rid the world of it. The whole world is tired of it. And got, got, so perpetually invoked, got indeed must be very tired of it. This is already the vastest war in history. It is war not of nations, but of mankind. It is a war to exercise a world madness and end an age. And note how this cant of public rottenness has had its secret side. The man who preaches cynicism in his own business transactions had better keep a detective and a cash register for his clerks, and it is the most natural thing in the world to find that this system, which is outwardly vile, is also inwardly rotten. Beside the Kaiser stands the firm of Krupp, a second head to the state. On the very steps of the throne is the Armament Trust, that organised scoundrelism which has, in its relentless propaganda for profit, mined all the security of civilization, brought up and dominated a press, ruled a national literature, and corrupted universities. Consider what the Germans have been and what the Germans can be. Here is a race which has for its chief fault docility and a belief in teachers and rulers. For the rest, as all who know it intimately will testify, it is the most amiable of peoples. It is naturally kindly, comfort-loving, child-loving, musical, artistic, intelligent. In countless respects, German homes and towns and countrysides are the most civilised in the world. But these people did a little lose their heads after the victories of the 60s and 70s, and there began a propaganda of national vanity and national ambition. It was organised by a stupidly forceful statesman. It was fostered by folly upon the throne. It was guarded from wholesale criticism by an intolerant censorship. It never gave sanity a chance. A certain patriotic sentimentality lent itself only too readily to the suggestion of the flatterer, and so there grew up this monstrous trade in weapons. German patriotism became an interest, the greatest of the interests. It developed a vast advertisement propaganda. It subsidised navy leagues and aerial leagues, threatening the world. Mankind, we saw too late, had been guilty of an incalculable folly in permitting private men to make a profit out of the dreadful preparations for war. But the evil was started. The German imagination was captured and enslaved. On every other European country that valued its integrity, there was thrust the overwhelming necessity to arm and drill, and still to arm and drill. Money was withdrawn from education, from social progress, from business enterprise, and art and scientific research, and from every kind of happiness, life was drilled and darkened, so that the harvest of this darkness comes now almost as a relief, and it is a grim satisfaction in our discomforts that we can at last look across the roar and torment of battlefields to the possibility of an organised peace. For this is now a war for peace. It aims straight at disarmament. It aims at a settlement that shall stop this sort of thing for ever. Every soldier who fights against Germany now is a crusader against war. This, the greatest of all wars, is not just another war. It is the last war. England, France, Italy, Belgium, Spain, and all the little countries of Europe are heartily sick of war. The Tsar has expressed a passionate hatred of war. The most of Asia is unwarlike. The United States has no illusions about war. And never was war begun so joyously, and never was war begun with so grim a resolution. In England, France, Belgium, Russia, there is no thought of glory. 
We know we face unprecedented slaughter and agonies. We know that for neither side will there be easy triumphs or prancing victories. Already, in that warring sea of men, there is famine as well as hideous butchery, and soon there must come disease. Can it be otherwise? We face perhaps the most awful winter that mankind has ever faced, but we English and our allies, who did not seek this catastrophe, face it with anger and determination rather than despair. Through this war we have to march through pain, through agonies of the spirit worse than pain, through seas of blood and filth. We English have not had things kept from us. We know what war is. We have no delusions. We have read books that tell us of the stench of battlefields and the nature of wounds, books that Germany suppressed and hid from her people, and we face these horrors to make an end of them. There shall be no more Kaisers, there shall be no more Krupps. We are resolved. That foolery shall end. And not simply the present belligerents must come into the settlement. All America, Italy, China, the Scandinavian powers must have a voice in the final readjustment and set their hands to the ultimate guarantees. I do not mean that they need to fire a single shot or load a single gun, but they must come in, and in particular to the United States do we look to play a part in that pacification of the world for which our whole nation is working, and for which, by the thousand, men are now laying down their lives. End of chapter one. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter two of the war that will end war by Herbert George Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. The sword of peace. Every sword that is drawn against Germany now is a sword drawn for peace. Europe is at war. The monstrous vanity that was begotten by the easy victories of 70 and 71 has challenged the world, and Germany prepares to reap the harvest Bismarck sowed. That trampling, drilling foolery in the heart of Europe, that has arrested civilization and darkened the hopes of mankind for forty years. German imperialism, German militarism, has struck its inevitable blow. The victory of Germany will mean the permanent enthronement of the war god over all human affairs. The defeat of Germany may open the way to disarmament and peace throughout the earth. To those who love peace there can be no other hope in the present conflict than the defeat, the utter discrediting of the German legend, the ending for good and all of the blood and iron superstition of Krupp, flag-waving Teutonic Kiplingism, and all that criminal sham efficiency that centres in Berlin. Never was war so righteous as war against Germany now. Never has any state in the world so clamoured for punishment. But be it remembered that Europe's quarrel is with the German state, not the German people, with a system and not with a race. The older tradition of Germany is a pacific and civilising tradition. The temperament of the mass of German people is kindly, sane and amiable. Disaster to the German army if it is unaccompanied by any such memorable wrong as dismemberment or intolerable indignity will mean the restoration of the greatest people in Europe to the fellowship of Western nations. The role of England in this huge struggle is plain as daylight. We have to fight if only on account of the Luxembourg outrage, we have to fight. If we do not fight, England will cease to be a country to be proud of. It will be a dirt bath to escape from. But it is inconceivable that we should not fight. And having fought, then in the hour of victory it will be for us to save the liberated Germans from vindictive treatment, to secure for this great people their right as one united German-speaking state, 
to a place in the sun. First we have to save ourselves and Europe, and then we have to stand between German on the one hand and the Cossack and revenge on the other. For my own part, I do not doubt that Germany and Austria are doomed to defeat in this war. It may not be catastrophic defeat, though even that is possible, but it is defeat. There is no destiny in the stars, and every sign is false if this is not so. They have provoked an overwhelming combination of enemies. They have underrated France. They are hampered by a bad social and military tradition. The German is not naturally a good soldier. He is orderly and obedient, but he is not nimble nor quick-witted. Since his sole considerable military achievement, his not very lengthy march to Paris in 1870 and 71, the conditions of modern warfare have been almost completely revolutionised, and in a direction that subordinates the massed fighting of unintelligent men to the rapid initiative of individualised soldiers. And, on the other hand, since those years of disaster, the Frenchman has learnt the lesson of humility. He is prepared now somberly for a sombre struggle. He is the gravity that precedes astonishing victories. In the air, in the open field, with guns and machines, it is doubtful if anyone fully realises the superiority of his quality to the German. This sudden attack may take him aback for a week or so, though I doubt even that, but in the end I think he will hold his own, even without us he will hold his own, and with us then I venture to prophesy that within three months from now his tricolor will be over the Rhine, and even suppose his line gets broken by the first rush, even then I do not see how the Germans are to get to Paris or anywhere near Paris. I do not see how, against the strength of the modern defensive and the stinging power of an intelligent enemy in retreat, of which we had a little foretaste in South Africa, the exploit of Sedan can be repeated. A retiring German army, on the other hand, will be far less formidable than a retiring French army, because it has less devil in it, because it is made up of men taught to obey in masses, because its intelligence is concentrated in its aristocratic officers, because it is dismayed when it breaks ranks. The German army is everything the conscriptionists dreamt of making our people. It is, in fact, an army about twenty years behind the requirements of contemporary conditions. On the eastern frontier, the issue is more doubtful because of the uncertainty of Russian things, the peculiar military strength of Russia, a strength it was not able to display in Manchuria, lies in its vast resources of mounted men. A set invasion of Prussia may be a matter of many weeks, but the raiding possibilities in eastern Germany are enormous. It is difficult to guess how far the Russian attack will be guided by intelligence and how far Russia will blunder, but Russia will have to blunder very disastrously indeed before she can be put upon the defensive. A Russian raid is far more likely to threaten Berlin than a German raid to reach Paris. Meanwhile, there is the struggle on the sea. In that I am prepared for some rude shocks. The Germans have devoted an amount of energy to the creation of an aggressive navy that would have been spent more wisely in consolidating their European position. It is probably a thoroughly good navy, and ship for ship the equal of our own, but the same lack of invention, the same relative uncreativeness that has kept the German behind the Frenchman in things aerial, has made him, regardless of his shallow seas, follow our lead in naval matters. And if we have erred, and I believe we have erred, in overrating the importance of the big battleship, the German has at least very obligingly fallen in with our error. The safest, most effective place for the German fleet at the present time is the Baltic Sea. On this side of the Kiel Canal, unless I overrate the powers of the water plane, there is no safe harbour for it. 
If it goes into port anywhere, that port can be ruined, and the bottled-up ships can be destroyed at leisure by aerial bombs. So that if they are on this side of the Kiel Canal, they must keep the sea and fight, if we let them, before their coal runs short. Battle in the open sea, in this case, is their only chance. They will fight against odds, and with every prospect of a smashing, albeit we shall certainly have to pay for that victory in ships and men. In the Baltic we shall not be able to get at them without the participation of Denmark, and they may have a considerable use against Russia. But in the end even their mine and aeroplane and destroyer should do their work. So I reckon that Germany will be held east and west, and she will get her fleet practically destroyed. We ought also to be able to sweep her shipping off the seas and lower her flag for ever in Africa and Asia and the Pacific. All the probabilities, it seems to me, point to that. There is no reason why Italy should not stick to her present neutrality, and there is considerable inducement close at hand for both Denmark and Japan to join in, directly they are convinced of the failure of the first big rush on the part of Germany. All these issues will be more or less definitely decided within the next two or three months. By that time, I believe German imperialism will be shattered, and it may be possible to anticipate the end of the armaments phase of European history. France, Italy, England and all the smaller powers of Europe are now Pacific countries. Russia, after this huge war, will be too exhausted for further adventure. A shattered Germany will be a revolutionary Germany, as sick of uniforms and the imperialist idea as France was in 1871, as disillusioned about predominance as Bulgaria is today. The way will be open at last for all these Western powers to organise peace. That is why I, with my declared horror of war, have not signed any of these Stop the War appeals and declarations that have appeared in the last few days. Every sword that is drawn against Germany now is a sword drawn for peace. End of chapter 2 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 3 of The War That Will End War by Herbert George Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 3. Hands Off the People's Food. This is a war-torn article, a convalescent article. It is characteristic of the cheerful gallantry of the time that after being left for dead on Saturday evening, this article should be able, in an only very slightly bandaged condition, to take its place in the firing line again on Thursday morning. It was first written late on Friday night. It was written in a mood of righteous excitement, and it was an extremely ineffective article. In the night I could not sleep because of its badness, and because I did so vehemently want to hit hard and get its effect. I turned out about two o'clock in the morning and redrafted it, and the next day I wrote it all over again, differently and carefully, and I think better. In the afternoon it was blown up by the discovery that Mr. Runciman had anticipated its essential idea. He had brought in, and the House had passed through all its stages, a bill to give the Board of Trade power to requisition and deal with hoarded or reserved food. That was exactly the demand of my article. My article, about to die, saluted this most swift and decisive government of ours. Then I perceived that there were still many things to be said about this requisitioning of food. The Board of Trade has got its powers, but apparently they have still to be put into operation. It is extremely desirable that there should be a strong public opinion supporting and watching the exercise of these powers, and that they should be applied at the proper point immediately. 
The powers Mr. Runciman has secured so rapidly for the Board of Trade have to be put into operation. There must be an equally rapid development of local committees and commandos to carry out this idea. The shortage continues. It is not over. The common people who are sending their boys so bravely and uncomplainingly to the front must be relieved at once from the intolerable hardships which a certain section of the prosperous classes, a small section but an actively mischievous section, is causing them. It is a right, not a demand for charity. It is ridiculous to treat the problem in any other way. So far the poorer English have displayed an amazing and exemplary patience in this crisis, a humility and courage that make one the prouder for being also English. Apart from any failure of employment at the present time, it must be plain to anyone who has watched the present rise of prices and who knows anything either at first hand of poor households or by reading such investigations as those of Mrs. Pember Reeves upon the family budgets of the poor, that the rank and file of our population cannot now be getting enough to eat. They are suffering needless deprivation, and also they are suffering needless vexation, and there is no atom of doubt why they are suffering these distresses. It is that pretentious section of the prosperous classes, the section we might hit off with the phrase automobile driving villadom, the tariff reform and damn Lloyd George and Keir Hardy class, the most pampered and least public spirited of any stratum in the community, which has grabbed at the food, it has given way to an inglorious panic, it has broken ranks and stampeded to the stores and made the one discreditable exception in the splendid spectacle of our national solidarity. While the attention of all decent English folk has been concentrated upon the preparations for our supreme blow at Prussian predominance in Europe, Villadom has been swarming to the shops, buying up the food of the common people, carrying it off in the family car, adorned, of course, with a fluttering little Union Jack. Father has given a day from business. Mother has helped. Even those shiny-headed nuts, the sons, have condescended to assist, and now Villadom, feeling a little safer, is ready with the dinner bell, its characteristic instrument of music, to mafic at the to spoil. And Villadom promoted and distended. Villadom in luck turned millionaire, Villadom on a scale that can buy a peerage and write you its thousands of pounds cheque for a showy subscription list has been true to its origins. Lord Maffick, emulating Mr. and Mrs. Maffick, swept the district clean of flour, let the thing go down to history. Lord Maffick now explains that he bought it to distribute among his poorer neighbours. That is going to be the stock excuse of these people. But that sort of buying is just exactly as bad for prices as buying for Lord Maffick's personal interior. The sooner that flower gets out of the houses of Lord Maffick and Horatio Maffick, Esquire, and young Mr Maffick and the rest of them, and into the houses of the poorer neighbours, the better for them and the country. The greatest danger to England at the present time is neither the German army nor the German fleet, but this morally rotten section of our community. Now it is no use scolding these people. It is no use appealing to their honour and patriotism. Honour they have none. And their idea of patriotism is to tax the foreigner, wave union jacks and clamour for the application to England of just that universal compulsory service which leads straight to those crowded ineffective massacres of common soldiers that are beginning upon the German war front. Exhortation may sway the ninety and nine, but the one mean man in the hundred will spoil the lot. The thing to do now is to get to work at once in every locality, requisitioning all excessive private stores of food or gold coins. They can be settled for after the war not only the stores of the private food grabbers but also the stores of the speculative wholesalers 
who are holding up prices to the retail shops. Only in that way can the operations of this intolerable little minority be completely checked. Under every county council, food committees should be formed at once to report on the necessities of the general mass and conduct inquiries into hoarding and the seizure and distribution of hoards, small and great. Now this is a public work calling for the most careful and open methods. Food distribution in England is partly in the hands of great systems of syndicated shops and partly still in the hands of one shop local tradesmen. It is imperative that the brightest light should be kept upon the operations of both small and large provision dealers. The big firms are in the control of men whose business successes have received in many instances marks of the signal favour and trust of our rulers. Lord Devonport, for example, is a peer. Sir Thomas Lipton is a baronet. They are not to be regarded as mere private traders, but as men honoured by association with the hierarchy of our national life on account of their distinguished share in the public food service. It will help them in their quasi-public duties to give them support of our attention. Are they devoting their enormous economic advantages to keeping prices at a reasonable level? Or are those various systems of syndicated provision shops also putting things up against the consumer? With concerted action on the part of these stores, the most perfect control of prices is possible everywhere, except in the case of a few out-of-the-way villages. Is it being done? Nobody wants to see the names of Lord Devonport and Sir Thomas Lipton or the various other rich men associated with them in the food supply flourishing about on royal subscription lists at the present time. Their work lies closer at hand. What we all want is to feel that they are devoting their utmost resources to the public food service of which they constitute so important a part. Let me say at once that I have every reason to believe they are doing it and that they are alive to the responsibilities of their positions. But we must keep the limelight on them and on their less honoured and conspicuous fellow merchants. They are playing as important and vital a part Indeed, they are called upon to play as brave and self-sacrificing a part as any general at the front. If they fail us, it will be worse than the loss of many thousands of men in battle. Let us watch them, and I believe we shall watch them with admiration. But let us watch them. Let us report their movements, ask them to reassure us, chronicle their visits to the Board of Trade. I will not expatiate upon the possible heroisms of the wholesale provision trade. I do but glance at the possibility of Lord Devonport or Sir Thomas Lipton, after the war, living, financially ruined, but glorious, in a little cottage. I gave back to the people, in their hour of need, what I made from them in their hours of plenty, he would say. I have suffered that thousands might not suffer. It is nothing Think of the lads who died in Belgium. By all accounts, the small one-shot provision dealers are behaving extremely well. In my own town of Dunmow, I know of two little shopkeepers who have dared to offend important customers rather than fulfil panic orders. They deserve medals. In poor districts, many such men are giving credit, eking out, tiding over, and all the time running tremendous risks. Not all heroes are upon the battlefield, and some of the heroes of this war are now fighting gallantly for our land behind grocers' counters and in village general shops, and may end, if not in the burial trench, in the bankruptcy court. Indeed, many of them are already on the verge of bankruptcy. The wholesalers have, I know, in many cases betrayed them, not simply by putting up prices, but by suddenly stopping customary credits and this last week has seen some dismal nights of sleepless worry in the little bedrooms over the isolated grocery. While we look to the syndicated shops to do their duty, it is of the utmost importance also that we should not permit a massacre of the small tradespeople. 
a catastrophe of the small shopkeeper at the present time will not only throw a multitude of broken men upon public resources, but leave a gap in the homely give and take of back street and village economies that will not be easily repaired. So I suggest that the requisition stocks of forestalling wholesalers, there ought to be a great bulk of such food stuff already in the hands of the authorities, shall be sold in the first instance at wholesale prices to the isolated shopkeepers and not directly to the public. Only in the event of local failure of duty should the direct course be taken. It must be remembered that the whole of the present stress for food is an artificial stress due to the vehement selfishness of vulgar-minded prosperous people and to the base cunning of quite exceptional merchants. But under the strange and difficult and planless conditions of today, quite a few people can start a rush and produce an almost irresistible pressure. The majority of people who have hoarded and forestalled have probably done so very unwillingly, because others will do it. They would welcome any authoritative action that would enable them to disgorge without feeling that somebody else would instantly snatch what they had surrendered and profit by it. It is for that reason that we must at once organise the commandeering and requisitioning of hoards and reserve goods. The mere threat will probably produce a great relaxation of the situation, but the threat must be carried out to the point of having everything ready as soon as possible to seize and sell and distribute. Until that is done, this food crisis will wax and wane, but it will not cease if we do not carry out Mr. Runciman's initiatives with a certain harsh promptness. Food trouble will be an intermittent wasting fever in the body politic until the end of the war. And the business will not be over at the end of the war. The patience of the common people has been astonishing. In countless homes there must have been the extremest worry and misery. But except for a few trivial rows, such as the smashing of the windows of Mr. Moss at Hitchin, who was probably not a bit to blame, an attack on a bakery somewhere, and some not very bad behaviour in the way of threats and demonstrations on the part of East End Jews, there has been no disorder at all. That is because the people are full of the first solemnity of war, eagerly trustful and still well nourished. At the end, unless the more prosperous people pull themselves together, it will not be like that. End of chapter 3 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 4 of The War That Will End War by Herbert George Wells This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 4 Concerning Mr. Maximilian Craft I find myself enthusiastic for this war against Prussian militarism. We are, I believe, assisting at the end of a vast, intolerable oppression upon civilization. We are fighting to release Germany and all the world from the superstition that brutality and cynicism are the methods of success, that imperialism is better than free citizenship and conscripts better soldiers than free men. And I find another writer who is also being, he declares, patriotically British. Indeed, he waves the Union Jack about to an extent from which my natural modesty recoils. Because, you see, I am English come Irish, and save for the cross of St Andrew, that flag is mine. To wave it about would, I feel, be just vulgar self-assertion. He, however, is not English. He assumes a variety of names, and some are quite lovely old English names. But his favourite name is Kraft. Maximilian Kraft, and I understand he was born a Kraft. He shoves himself into the affairs of this country with an extraordinary energy. He takes possession of my Union Jack, as if St George was his father. At present he is advising me very actively how to conduct this war, and telling me exactly what I ought to think about it. He is, in fact, the English equivalent of those professors of Welt politic 
who have guided the German mind to its present magnificent display of shrewd, triumphant statecraft. I suspect him of a distant cousinship with Professor Delbruck, and he is urging upon our attention now a magnificent coup with which I will shortly deal. In appearance, Kraft is by no means completely anglicised himself. He is a large-faced creature with enormous long features and a woolly head. He is heavy in build and with a back slightly hunched. He lifts slightly and his manner is either insolently contemptuous or aggressively familiar. He thinks all born Englishmen, as distinguished from the naturalised Englishmen, are also born fools. Always his manner is pervaded by a faint flavour of astonishment at the born foolishness of the born Englishman. But he thinks their empire a marvellous accident, a wonderful opportunity for cleverer people. So, with a kind of disinterested energy, he has been doing his best to educate Englishmen up to their imperial opportunities, to show them how to change luck into cunning, take the wall of every other breed and swagger foremost in the world. He cannot understand that English blood does not warm to such ambitions. When he has wealth, it is his nature to show it, in watch-chains and studs and signet-rings. If he had a wife, she would dazzle in diamonds. The furniture of his flat is wonderfully good, all picked English pieces and worth no end. He thinks it is just dullness and poorness of spirit that disregards these things. He came to England to instruct us in the arts of empire, when he found that already there was a glut of his kind of wisdom in the German universities. For years until this present outbreak, I have followed his career with silent interest rather than affection, and the first thing he undertook to teach us was, I remember, tariff reform, taxing the foreigner, limitless wealth you get, and you pay nothing. You get a huge national income in imported goods, and also, as your tariff prevents importation, you develop a tremendous internal trade. Two birds, in quite opposite directions, with the same stone. It seemed just plain common sense to him. Anyhow, he felt sure it was good enough for the born English. He is still a little incredulous of our refusal to accept that delightful idea. Meanwhile, his kind have dominated the more docile German intelligence altogether. They have listened to the whisper of Welt politic, or at least their rulers have attended. They have sown aspiration on every frontier, taken the wall, done all the showily aggressive and successful things. They were the pupils he should have taught, a people at once teachable and spirited. Almost tearfully, Kraft has asked us to mark that glorious progress of a once philosophical, civilised and kindly people. And indeed we have had to mark it and polish our weapons, and with a deepening resentment get more and more weapons, and keep our powder dry, when we would have been far rather occupied with other things. But amazingly enough, we would not listen to his suggestion of universal service. Kraft and his kind believe in numbers. Even the Boer War could not shake his natural aptitude for political arithmetic. He has tried to bring the situation home to us by diagrams, showing us enormous figures, colossal soldiers to represent the German forces, and tiny little British men, smaller than the army figures for Bulgaria and for Serbia. He does not understand that there can be too many soldiers on a field of battle. He could as soon believe that one could have too much money, and so he thinks the armies of Russia must be more powerful than the French. When I deny that superiority, as I do, he simply notes the fact that I am unable to count. And when it comes to schemes of warfare, then a kind of delirium of cunning descends upon craft. 
He is full of devices such as we poor fools cannot invent. Sudden attacks without a declaration of war, vast schemes for spy systems and assassin-like disguises. The cowing of a country by the wholesale shooting of uncivil non-combatants, breaches of neutrality, national treacheries, altered dispatches, forged letters, diplomatic lies, a perfect world organisation of super-sneaks. Our poor cousin, Michael, the German, has listened to such wisdom only too meekly. Poor Michael, with his honest blue eyes, wander-lit, has tried his best to be a very devil and go where Kraft's cousin, Bernardi, the military expert, has led him. So far it has led him into the ditches of Liège and the gorges of the Ardennes and much hunger and dirt and blood. And Kraft over here has watched with an intolerable envy Berlin lying and bullying and being the very superman of welt politic. He has been talking, writing, praying us to do likewise, to strike suddenly before the war was declared at the German fleet, to outrage the neutrality of Denmark, to seize Holland, to do something nationally dishonest and disgraceful. Daily he has raged at our milk and water methods. At times we have seemed to him more like a lot of Woodrow Wilsons than reasonable sane men. And he is still at it. Only a few days ago I took up the paper that has at last moved me to the very plain declarations of this article. It was an English daily paper, and Kraft was telling us, as usual, and with his usual despairful sense of our stupidity how to conduct this war and what he said was this that we have to starve germany not realizing that with her choked railways and her wasted crops germany may be trusted very rapidly to starve herself and that if we do not prevent them foodstuffs will go into germany by way of holland and italy so he wants us to begin at once a hostile blockade of Holland and Italy, or better perhaps to send each of these innocent and friendly countries an ultimatum forthwith. He wants it done at once, because otherwise the Berlin crafts, some Delbruck or Bernhardi, or that egregious young statesman, the Crown Prince, may persuade the Prussians to get in their ultimatum first then we should have no chance of doing anything internationally idiotic at all, unless, perhaps, we seized a port in Norway. It might be rather a fine thing, he thinks upon reflection, to seize a port in Norway. Now let us English make it clear once for all to the crafts and other kindred patriotic gentlemen from abroad who are showing us the really artful way to do things, that this is not our way of doing things. Into this war we have gone with clean hands to end the reign of brutal and artful internationalism for ever. Our hearts are heavy at the task before us, but our intention is grim. We mean to conquer. We are prepared for every disaster, for intolerable stresses, for bankruptcy, for hunger, for anything but defeat. Now that we have begun to fight, we will fight, if needful, until the children die of famine in our homes. We will fight, though every ship we have is at the bottom of the sea. We mean to fight this war to its very finish, and that finish, we are absolutely resolved, must be the end of craftism in the world. And we will come out of this war with hands as clean as they are now, unstained by any dirty tricks in field or council chamber, neutralities respected and treaties kept. Then we will reckon once for all with Kraft and with his friends and supporters, the private dealers in armaments, and with all this monstrous stupid brood of villainy that has brought this vast catastrophe upon the world.
I say this plainly now for myself and for thousands of silent, plain men, because the sooner Kraft realises how we feel in this matter, the better for him. He betrays at times a remarkable persuasion that at the final settling up of things he will make himself invaluable to us. At diplomacy he knows he shines. Then the lisping whisper has its use and the studied insolence. Finish the fighting and then leave it to him. He really believes the born English will. He does not understand in the slightest degree the still passion of our streets. There never was less shouting and less demonstration in England, and never was England so quietly intent. This war is not going to end in diplomacy. It is going to end diplomacy. It is quite a different sort of war from any that have gone before it. At the end there will be no conference of Europe on the old lines at all, but a conference of the world. It will be a conference for Kraft to laugh at. He will run about buttonholing people about it, almost spitting in their faces with the eagerness of his derisive whispers. It will conduct its affairs with scandalous publicity and a deliberate simplicity. It will be worse than Woodrow Wilson, and it will make a peace that will put an end to craft and the spirit of craft and craftism and the private armament firms behind him for evermore. At which I imagine the head of craft going down between his shoulders and his large hands going out like the wings of a cherub. Englishmen, liberals, fools, incurable, how can such things be? It is not how things are done. It is how they are going to be done if this world is to be worth living in at all after this war. When we fight Berlin, Kraft, we fight you. An absolute end to you. Yes. End of chapter 4 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 5 of The War That Will End War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 5. The Most Necessary Measures in the World. In this smash-up of empires and diplomacy, this utter disaster of international politics, certain things which would have seemed ridiculously utopian a few weeks ago have suddenly become reasonable and practical. One of these, a thing that would have seemed fantastic until the very moment when we joined issue with Germany, and which may now be regarded as a sober possibility, is the absolute abolition throughout the world of the manufacture of weapons for private gain. Whatever may be said of the practicability of national disarmament, there can be no dispute, not merely of the possibility, but of the supreme necessity of ending for ever the days of private profit in the instruments of death. That is the real enemy. That is the evil thing at the very centre of this trouble. At the very core of all this evil that has burst at last in the world disaster lies this cruppism, this sordid, enormous trade in the instruments of death. It is the closest, most gigantic organization in the world. Time after time, this huge business, with its bought newspapers, its paid spies, its agents, its shareholders, its insane sympathizers, its vast ramification of open and concealed associates, has defeated attempts at pacification, has piled the heap of explosive material higher and higher, the heap that has toppled at last into this bloody welter in Belgium, in which the lives of four great nations are now being torn and tormented and slaughtered and wasted beyond counting, beyond imagining. I dare not picture it, thinking now of who may read. So long as the unstable peace endured, so long as the emperor of the Germans and the Krupp concern and the vanities of Prussia hung together, threatening but not assailing the peace of the world, so long as one could dream of holding off the crash and saving lives, 
so long was it impossible to bring this business to an end or even to propose plainly to bring this business to an end it was still possible to argue that to be prepared for war was the way to keep the peace but now everyone knows better the war has come preparation has exploded outrageous plunder has passed into outrageous bloodshed all europe is in revolt against this evil system there is no going back now to peace our men must die in heaps in thousands we cannot delude ourselves with dreams of easy victories we must all suffer endless miseries and anxieties scarcely a human affair is there that will not be marred and darkened by this war out of it all must come one universal resolve that this iniquity must be plucked out by the roots whatever follies still lie ahead for mankind this folly at least must end there must be no more buying and selling of guns and warships and war machines there must be no more gain in arms kings and kaisers must cease to be the commercial travellers of monstrous armament concerns with the gerben the kaiser has made his last sale whatever arms the nations think they need they must make for themselves and give to their own subjects beyond that there must be no making of weapons in the earth this is the clearest common sense i do not need to argue what is manifest what every german knows what every intelligent educated man in the world knows the Krupp concern and the tawdry imperialism of Berlin are linked like thief and receiver. The hands of the German princes are dirty with the trade. All over the world statecraft and royalty have been approached and touched and tainted by these vast firms. But it is in Berlin that the corruption has centres. It is from Berlin that the intolerable pressure to arm and still to arm has come it is at berlin alone that the evil can be grappled and killed before this there was no reaching it it was useless to dream even of disarmament while these people could still go on making their material uncontrolled waiting for the moment of national passion feeding the national mind with fears and suspicions through their subsidized press but now there is a new spirit in the world there are no more fears the worst evil has come to pass. The ugly hatreds, the nourished misconceptions of an armed peace, begin already to give place to the mutual respect and pity and disillusionment of a universally disastrous war. We can at last deal with Krupps and the kindred firms throughout the world as one general problem, one worldwide accessible evil outside the circle of belligerent states and the states which like denmark italy romania norway and sweden must necessarily be invited to take a share in the final resettlement of the world's affairs there are only three systems of powers which need be considered in this matter namely the english and spanish-speaking republics of america and china none of these states is deeply involved in the armaments trade several of them have every reason to hate a system that has linked the obligation to deal in armaments with every loan the united states of america is now more than ever it was an anti-militarist power and it is not too much to say that the government of the united states of america holds in its hand the power to sanction or prevent this most urgent need of mankind if the people of the united states will consider and grasp this tremendous question now if they will make up their minds now that there shall be no more profit made in america or anywhere else upon the face of the earth in raw material if they will determine to put the vast moral financial and material influence the united states will be able to exercise at the end of this war in the scale against the survival of cruppism then it will be possible to finish that vile industry for ever. If, through a failure of courage or imagination, they will not come into this thing, then I fear if it may be done. But I misjudge the United States if, in the end, they abstain from so glorious and congenial an opportunity. 
Let me set out the suggestion very plainly. All the plant for the making of war material throughout the world must be taken over by the government of the state in which it exists. Every gun factory, every rifle factory, every dockyard for the building of warships. It may be necessary to compensate the shareholders more or less completely. There may have to be a war indemnity to provide for that. But that is a question of detail. The thing is the conversion everywhere of arms-making into a state monopoly, so that nowhere shall there be a hapeth of avoidable private gain in it. Then, and then only, will it become possible to arrange for the gradual dismantling of this industry which is destroying humanity, and the reduction of the armed forces of the world to reasonable dimensions. I would carry this suppression down even to the restriction of the manufacture and sale of every sort of gun, pistol, and explosive. They should be made only in government workshops and sold only in government shops. There should not be a single rifle, not a browning pistol, unregistered, unrecorded, and untraceable in the world. But that may be a council of perfection. The essential thing is the world suppression of this abominable traffic in the big gear of war, in warships and great guns. With this corruption cleared out of the way, with the armament's commercial traveller flung down the back stairs he has haunted for so long, and flung so hard that he will be incapacitated for ever, it will become possible to consider a scheme for the establishment of the peace of the world. Until that is done, any such scheme will remain an idle dream. But him disposed of, the way is open for the association of armed nations, determined to stamp out at once every recrudescence of aggressive war. They will not be totally disarmed powers. It is no good to disarm while any one single power is still in love with the dream of military glory. It is no good to disarm while the possibility of war fever is still in the human blood. The intelligence of the whole world must watch for febrile symptoms and prepare to allay them. But after this struggle, one may count on the pacific intentions of at least the following states, the British Empire, France, Italy, and all the minor states of the North and West. The United States has always been a pacific power. Japan has had its lesson and is too impoverished for serious hostilities. China has humiliations for the German spirit, will be war sick. The Spanish and Portuguese speaking republics of America are too busy developing materially to dream of war on the modern scale, and the same may presently be true of the Greek, Latin, and Slav communities of Southeast Europe if, as I hope and believe, this war leads to the rational rearrangement of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 1915 will indeed find this world a strangely tamed and reasonable world. There's only one doubtful country, Russia, and for my part I do not believe in the wickedness and I doubt the present power of that stupendous barbaric state. Finland and a renaissance Polish kingdom at least will be weight on the side of peace. It will be indeed the phase of supreme opportunity for peace. If there is courage and honesty enough in men, I believe it will be possible to establish a world council for the regulation of armaments as the natural outcome of this war. First, the trade in armaments must be absolutely killed, and the next supremely important measure to secure the peace of the world is the neutralisation of the sea. It will lie in the power of England, France, Russia, Italy, Japan and the United States, if Germany and Austria are shattered in this war, to forbid the further building of any more ships of war at all, to persuade, and if need be, to oblige the minor powers to sell their navies and to refuse the seas to armed ships not under the control of the Confederation. To launch an armed ship can be made an invasion of the common territory of the world. This will be an open possibility in 1915. It will remain an open possibility until men recover from the shock of this conflict. As that begins to be forgotten, so this will cease to be a possibility again, perhaps for hundreds of years. 
Already human intelligence and honesty have contrived to keep the great American lakes and the enormous Canadian frontier disarmed for a century. Warlike folly has complained of that, but it has never been strong enough to upset it. What is possible on that scale is possible universally, so soon as the armament trader is put out of mischief. And with the confederated peace powers keeping the seas and guaranteeing the peaceful freedom of the seas to all mankind, treating the transport of armed men and war material, except between one detached part of a state and another, as contraband, and impartially blockading all belligerents. Those who know best the significance of the sea power will realise best the reduction in the danger of extensive wars on land. This is no dream. This is the plain common sense of the present opportunity. It may be urged that this is a premature discussion, that this war is still undecided. But, indeed, there can be no decision to this war for France and England, at any rate, but the defeat of Germany the abandonment of German militarism, the destruction of the German fleet, and the creation of this opportunity. Nothing short of that is tolerable. We must fight on to extinction rather than submit to a dishonouring peace in defeat or to any premature settlement. The fate of the world under triumphant Prussianism and Kruppism for the next two hundred years is not worth discussing. There is no conceivable conclusion to this war but submission at Berlin. There is no reasonable course before us now but to give all our strength for victory and the establishment of victory. The end must be victory or our effacement. What will happen after our effacement is for the Germans to consider. A war that will merely beat Germany a little and restore the hateful tensions of the last 40 years is not worth waging. As an end to all our effort, it will be almost as intolerable as defeat. Yet unless a body of definite ideas is formed and promulgated, now things may happen so. And so now, while there is yet time, the liberalism of France and England must speak plainly and make its appeal to the liberalism of all the world, not to share our war indeed, but to share the great ends for which we are so gladly waging this war. For indeed, sombrely enough, England and France and Belgium and Russia are glad of this day. The age of armed anxiety is over. Whatever betide, it must be an end, and there is no way of making it an end but through these two associated decisions, the abolition of Kruppism and the neutralisation of the sea. End of chapter 5 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 6 of The War That Will End War by Herbert George Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 6. The Need of a New Map of Europe. At the moment of writing, the war has not lasted many days. Great battles by land and sea alike impend, and yet I find my steadfast anticipation that Prussianism, Bernardism, the whole theory and practice of the empire of the Germans, is a rotten and condemned thing, has already strengthened to an absolute conviction. Unforeseen accidents may happen. I say nothing of the sea, but the general and ultimate result seems to me now as certain as the rising of tomorrow's sun. I do not know how much slaughter lies before Europe before Germany realises that she is fool-led, and fool poisoned. I do not know how long the swaggering Prussian officer will be able to drive his crowded men to massacre before they revolt against him, nor do I know how far the inflated vanity of Berlin has made provision for defeat. Germany, on the defensive for all we can tell, may prove a very stubborn thing, and Russia's strength may be, and I think is, overestimated. All that may delay, but it will not alter the final demonstration that Prussianism, as Mr. Belloc foretold so amazingly, took its mortal wound at the first onset before the trenches of Liège. We begin a new period of history. It is not Germany that has been defeated. Germany is still an unconquered country. Indeed, now it is a released country. 
It is a country glorious in history and with a glorious future, but never more after this war has ended will it march to the shout of the Prussian drill sergeant and strive to play bully to the world. The legend of Prussia is exploded. Its appeal was to one coarse criterion, success, and it has failed. Never more will the harshness of Berlin overshadow the great and friendly civilization of southern and western Germany. The work before a world in arms is to clean off the Prussian blue from the life and spirit of mankind. No European power has any real quarrel with Germany. Our quarrel is with the empire of the Germans, not with a people but with an idea. Let us, in all that follows, keep that clearly in our minds. It may be that the German repulse at Liège was but the beginning of a German disaster as great as that of France in 1871. It may be that Germany has no second plan if her first plan fails, that she will go to pieces after her first defeat. It seems to me that this is so. I risked the prophecy, and I would have us prepare ourselves for the temptations of victory. And so to begin with, let us of the liberal faith declare our fixed unalterable conviction that it will be a sin to dismember Germany or to allow any German-speaking and German-feeling territory to fall under a foreign yoke. Let us English make sure of ourselves in the matter. There may be restorations of alien territory, Polish, French, Danish, Italian, but we have seen enough of racial subjugation now to be sure that we will tolerate no more of it. From the Rhine to East Prussia and from the Baltic to the southern limits of German-speaking Austria, the Germans are one people. Let us begin with the resolution to permit no new bitterness of conquered territories to come into existence to disturb the future peace of Europe. Let us see to it that at the ultimate settlement the Germans, however great his overthrow may be, are all left free men. When the Prussians invaded Luxembourg, they tore up the map of Europe. To the redrawing of that map, a thousand complex forces will come. There will be much attempted overreaching in the business and much greed. Few will come to negotiations with simple intentions. In a wrangle, all sorts of ugly and stupid things may happen. It is for us English to get ahead in that matter, to take counsel with ourselves and to determine what is just. It is for us, who are in so many ways detached from and independent of the national passions of the continent, not to be cunning or politic, but to contrive as unanimous a purpose as possible now, so that we may carry this war to its end with a clear conception of its end, and to use the whole of our strength to make an enduring peace in Europe. That means we have to redraw the map, so that there shall be, for just as far as we can see ahead, as little cause for warfare among us Western nations as possible. That means that we have to redraw it justly, and very extensively. Is that an impossible proposal? I think not. There are indeed such things as non-irritating frontiers. Witness the frontiers of Canada. Certain boundaries have served in Europe now for the better part of a hundred years and grow less amenable to disturbance every year. Nobody, for example, wants to use force to readjust the mutual frontiers in Europe of Holland, Belgium, France, Spain, Portugal and Italy, and none of these powers desire now to acquire the foreign possessions of any other of the group. They are powers permanently at peace. Will it not be possible now to make so drastic a readjustment as to secure the same practical contentment between all the European powers? Is not this war that crowning opportunity? It seems to me that in this matter it behoves us to form an opinion sane and definite enough to meet the sudden impulses of belligerent triumph and override the secret counsels of diplomacy. It is a thing to do forthwith. Let us decide what we are going on fighting for, and let us secure it and settle it. It is not an abstract, interesting thing to do. It is the duty of every English citizen now to study the problem of the map of Europe, so that we can make an end for ever to that dark game of plots and secret treaties, and clap-trap synthetic schemes that has wasted the forces of civilization, 
and made the fortunes of the Krupp family in the last forty years. We are fighting now for a new map of Europe, if we are fighting for anything at all. I could imagine that new map of Europe as if it were the flag of the Allies who now prepare to press the Germans back towards their proper territory. In the first place, I suggest that France must recover Lorraine, and that Luxembourg must be linked in closer union with Belgium. Alsace, it seems to me, should be given a choice between France and an entry into the Swiss Confederation. It would possibly choose France. Denmark should have again the distinctly Danish part of her lost provinces restored to her. Trieste and Trent, and perhaps also Pola, should be restored to Italy. This will reunite several severed fragments of peoples to their more congenial associates, but these are minor changes compared with the new developments that are now, in some form, inevitable in the east of Europe, and for those we have to nerve our imaginations, if this vast war and waste of men is to end in an enduring peace. The break-up of the Austrian Empire has hung over Europe like a curse for forty years. Let us break it up now and have done with it. What is to become of the non-German regions of Austria-Hungary? And what is to happen upon the Polish frontier of Russia? First, then, I would suggest that the three fragments of Poland should be reunited and that the Tsar of Russia should be crowned King of Poland. I propose then we define that as our national intention, that we use all the liberalising influence this present war will give us in Russia to that end. And secondly, I propose that we set before ourselves as our policy the unification of that larger Romania, which includes Transylvania, and the gathering together into a confederation of the Swiss type of all the Servian and quasi-Servian provinces of the Austrian Empire. Let us, as the price greater Servia will pay for its unity, exact the restoration to Bulgaria of any Bulgarian-speaking districts that are now under Servian rule. Let us save Scutari from the iniquity of a nose-slashing occupation by Montenegrins, and try to effect another Swiss confederation of the residual Bohemia, Slavic and Hungarian fragments. I am convinced that the time has come for the substitution of Swiss associations for the discredited imperialisms and kingdoms that have made Europe unstable for so long. Every emperor and every king we now perceive means a national ambition more organic, concentrated and dangerous than is possible under republican conditions. Our own peculiar monarchy is the one exception that proves the rule. There is no reason why we should have multiply these centres of aggression. Probably neither Bulgaria nor Servia would miss their kings very keenly, and anyhow I do not see any need for more of these irritating ambition pimples upon the fair face of the world. Let us cease to give indigestible princes to the new states that we Schweizerize. Albania, particularly, with its miscellaneous tribes, has certainly no use for monarchy, and the suggestion that has been made for its settlement as a confederation of small tribal cantons is the only one I've ever heard that seemed to contain a ray of hope for that distracted patch of earth. There is certainly no reason why these people should be exploited by Italy, since Italy can claim a more legitimate gratification. There, in a paragraph is a sketch of the map of Europe that may emerge from the present struggle. It is my personal idea of our purpose in this war. Quite manifestly, in all these matters, I am a fairly ignorant person. Quite manifestly, this is crude stuff, and I admit a certain sense of presumptuous absurdity. As I sit here before the map of Europe like a carver before a duck and take off a slice here and decide on a cut there, Nonetheless, it is what every one of us has to do. I intend to go on redrawing the map of Europe with every intelligent person I meet. We are all more or less ignorant. It is unfortunate, but it does not alter the fact that we cannot escape either decisions or passive acquiescences in these matters. If we do not do our utmost to understand the new map, if we make no decisions, then still cruder things will happen. Europe will blunder into a new set of ugly complications and prepare a still more colossal Armageddon than this that is now going on. 
No one, I hope, will suggest after this war that we should still leave things to the diplomatists. Yet the alternative to you and me is diplomacy. If you want to see where diplomacy and welt politic have landed Europe after 40 years of anxiety and armament, you must go and look into the ditches of Liège. These bloody heaps are the mere first samples of the harvest. The only alternative to diplomacy is outspoken intelligence, yours and mine and every articulate person's. We have all of us to undertake this redrawing of the map of Europe in the measure of our power and capacity. That our power and capacity are unhappily not very considerable does not absolve us. It is for us to secure a lasting settlement of all the European fronters if we can. If we common intelligent people at large do not secure that, nobody will. If we have no intentions with regard to the map of Europe, we shall soon be going on with the war for nothing in particular. The Prussian spirit has broken itself beyond repair, and the north coast of France and the integrity of Belgium are saved. All the fighting that is still to come will only be the confirmation and development of that. If we have no further plan before us, our task is at an end. If that is all, we may stand aside now with a good conscience and watch a slower war drag to an evil end. Left to herself, a victorious Russia is far more likely to help herself to East Prussia and set to work to Russianize its inhabitants than to risk an indigestion of more Poles. Italy may go into Albania and a new conflict with Serbia. It is even conceivable that France may be ungenerous. She will have a good excuse for being ungenerous. Meanwhile, German-speaking populations will find themselves under instead of upper dogs in half the provinces of Austria-Hungary. Mischievous little kings, with chancellors and national policies and ambitions all complete, will rise and fluctuate and fall upon that slippery soil, and a bloody and embittered Germany, continually stung by the outcries of her subject kindred, will sit down grimly to grow a new generation of soldiers and prepare for her revenge. That is why I think we liberal English should draw our new map of Europe now, first of all on paper and then upon the face of the earth. We ought to draw that map now and propagate the idea of it and make it our national purpose and call the intelligence and consciousnesses of the United States and France and Scandinavia to our help. Openly and plainly we ought to discuss and decide and tell the world what we mean to do. The reign of brutality, cynicism and secretive treachery is shattered in Europe. Over the ruins of the Prussian war lordship reason, public opinion, justice, international good faith and good intentions will be free to come back and rule the destinies of man. But things will not wait for reason and justice if just and reasonable men have neither energy nor unity. End of chapter 6 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 7 of the war that will end war by herbert george wells this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by peter tomlinson the opportunity of liberalism the opportunity of liberalism has come at last an overwhelming opportunity the age of militarism has rushed to its inevitable and yet surprising climax the great soldier empire made for war, which has dominated Europe for forty years, has pulled itself up by the roots and flung itself into the struggle for which it was made. Whether it win or lose, it will never put itself back again. All Europe, following that lead, is a field for war. The good harvests stand neglected, the factories are idle, a thin, uncertain trickle of paper money replaces the chinking flow of commerce. Whichever betide, defeat or deadlock, the capitalist military civilization uproots itself and ends. The war may burn itself out more quickly than those who regard its immensity think. But the war itself is the mere smash of the thing. The reality is the uprooting, the incurable dislocation. Trying to map and measure that dislocation is rather like one's first effort to think in sun's distances. 
It is to transfer one's mind to a new and overwhelming scale. Never did any time carry so swift a burden of change as this time. It is manifest that in a year or so the world of men is going to alter more than it has altered in the last century and a half, more indeed than it ever altered before these last centuries since history began. Think of the mere geographical dislocation. There is scarcely a country in Europe that will not emerge from this struggle with entirely fresh frontiers. Sovereign powers will vanish from the map. New sovereign powers will come. In the disorders that are upon us, and of which this war itself is the mere preliminary phase in uniform, inevitably there must be social reconstruction. Who can doubt it? Who can doubt the break-up of confidence and usage that is in progress? Plainly, you can see famine coming in France, in Germany, in Russia. Does anyone suppose that those sham efficient Germans have fully worked out the care and feeding of the madly distended hosts they have hurled at France. Does anyone dream that they have reckoned for a check and halt? Does anyone imagine their sanitary arrangements are perfect? There will be pestilence. And can one believe that whatever feats of financial fiction we contrive, their financial crash can be staved off, and that the bankers of Hamburg and Frankfurt are likely to be shoveling gold next January in a still methodical world? The German state machine has probably already done all that it was ever made to do. It stands now exhausted amidst the turmoil of its consequences. Its mobilisation arrangements are said to have been astonishingly complete. Ten million men for and against have been got into the field with ammunition. Prussian Germany has carried out its arrangements and committed the business to got. German foresight has exhausted itself. If Gott failed Germany, I do not believe that Germany has the remotest idea what to do next. For the most part, those millions will never get home any more. They will certainly never get back to their work again, because it will have disappeared. When I think of European statecraft, presently trying to put all these things back again, I am reminded of a story of a friend whose neighbour tried to cut his throat and then repented. He came round to her with a towel about his neck, making peculiar noises. It was a distressing but illuminating experience for her. She was a plucky and resourceful woman, and she did her best. There was such a lot of it, she said. I hadn't an idea things were packed so tight in us. It is characteristic of such times as this that much of the world, and, more particularly, much of the minds of men, much that has seemed as invincible as the mountains and as deeply rooted as the sea, magically loses its solidity, fades, changes, vanishes. When one looked at the map of Europe a month ago, most of the lines of its frontiers seemed almost as stable as the coastlines. Now they waver under one's eyes. When one thought of the heritage of the Crown Prince of Germany, it seemed as fixed as a constellation. And now, in a little while, it may be worth as little as a bloody rag in the trenches of Liège. In little things, as in great, one is suddenly confronted by undreamt of instabilities. The Reform Club, which has been a cheerful and refreshing trickle of gold to me for years, now yields me reluctantly for my cheque two inartistic pound notes. My other club has ceased the kindly custom of cashing cheques altogether. One is glad that poor Bagahot did not live to see this day. Each day now I marvel to wake and find I have still a banker. And I perceive, too, that if presently my banker dissolved into the rest of this dissolving world, a thing I should have thought an unendurable calamity a month ago, I shall laugh and go on. Ideas that have ruled life as though they were divine truths are being chased and slaughtered in the streets. The rights of property, for example, the sturdy virtues of individualism, all toleration of the rewards of abstinence, vanished last week suddenly amidst the execrations of mankind upon a hurrying motor-car loaded with packages of sugar and flour. 
they bolted, leaving socialism and collectivism in possession. The state takes over flour mills and the food supply, not merely for military purposes, but for the general welfare of the community. The state controls the railways with a sudden complete disregard of shareholders. There is not even a letter to the Times to object. If the state sees fit to keep its hold upon these things for good, or loosens its hold only to improve its grip, I question if there is much left in the minds of men, even after the mere preliminary sweeping of the last two weeks, to dispute possession. Society as we knew it a year ago has indeed already broken up. It has lost all real cohesion. Only the absence of any attraction elsewhere keeps us bunched together. We keep our relative positions because there is no hither to stampede. Dazed, astonished people fill the streets, and we talk of the national calm. The more intelligent men thrown out of their jobs make for the recruiting offices because they have nothing else to do. We talk of the magnificent response to Lord Kitchener's appeal. Everybody is offering services. Everybody is looking for someone to tell him what to do. It is not organisation. It is the first phase of dissolution. I am not writing prophecies now, and I am not displaying imagination. I am just running as hard as I can by the side of the marching facts and pointing to them. Institutions and conventions crumble about us and release to unprecedented power the two sorts of rebel that ordinary times suppress, will and ideas. The character of the new age that must come out of the catastrophes of this epoch will be no mechanical consequence of inanimate forces. Will and ideas will take a larger part in this swirl ahead of them than they have ever taken in any previous collapse. No doubt the mass of mankind will still pour along the channels of chance, but the desire for a new world of a definite character will be a force, and if it is multitudinously unanimous enough, it may even be a guiding force in shaping the new time. The common man and base men are scared to docility. Rulers, pomposities, obstructives are suddenly apologetic, helpful, asking for help. This is a time of incalculable plasticity. For the men who know what they want, the moment has come. It is a supreme opportunity, the test or condemnation of constructive liberal thought in the world. Now what does liberalism mean to do? It has always been alleged against liberalism that it is carpingly critical, disorganised, dispersed, impracticable, fractious, readier to resign and rebel than help. That is the common excuse of all modern autocracies, bureaucracies and dogmatisms. Are they right? Is liberal thought in this world crisis going to present the spectacle of a swarm of little wrangling men swept before the mindless bosom of brute accident, or shall we be able in this vast collapse or rebirth of the world to produce and express ideas that will rule? Has it all been talk, or has it been planning? Is the new world, in fact, to be shaped by the philosophers or by the Huns? First, as in peace, do liberals realise that now is the time to plan the confederation and collective disarmament of Europe. Now is the time to redraw the map of Europe so that there may be no more rankling sores or unsatisfied national ambitions. Are the liberals, as a body, going to cry, peace, peace, and leave the questions alone, or are they going to take hold of them? If liberalism throughout the world develops no plan of a pacified world until the diplomatists get to work, it will be too late. Peace may come to Europe this winter as swiftly and disastrously as the war. And next, as to social reconstruction. Do liberals realise that the individualist capitalist system is helpless now? It may be picked up unresistingly. It is stunned. A new economic order may be improvised and probably will in some manner 
be improvised in the next two or three years? What are the intentions of liberalism? What will be the contribution of liberalism? One poor liberal, I perceive, is possessed, to the exclusion of every other consideration, by the idea that we were not legally bound to fight for Belgium. A pretty point, but a petty one. Liberalism is something greater than unfavourable comment on the deeds of active men. Let us set about defining our intentions. Let us borrow a little from the rash vigour of the types that have contrived this disaster. Let us make a truce of our finer feelings and control our dissentient passions. Let us redraw the map of Europe boldly, as we mean it to be redrawn, and let us replan society as we mean it to be reconstructed. Let us get to work while there is still a little time left to us, or while our futile fine intelligences are busy, each with its particular exquisitely felt point. The Northcliffs and the diplomatists, the welt politic whisperers, and the financiers and militarists, the armaments interests, and the Cossack Tsar, terrified by the inevitable red dawn of leaderless social democracy, by the beginning of the stupendous stampede that will follow this great jar and displacement, will surely contrive some monstrous blundering settlement, and the latter state of this world will be worse than the former. Now is the opportunity to do fundamental things that will otherwise not get done for hundreds of years. If liberals throughout the world and in this matter the liberalism of America is a stupendous possibility, will insist upon a world conference at the end of this conflict if they refuse all partial settlements and merely European solutions. They may redraw every frontier they choose. They may reduce a thousand chafing conflicts of race and language and government to a minimum and set up a peace league that will control the globe. The world will be ripe for it, and the world will be ripe, too, for the vanishment of the private industry in armaments and all the vast corruption that entails from the earth for ever. It is possible now to make an end to cruppism. It may never be possible again. Henceforth, let us say, weapons must be made by the state, and only by the state. There must be no more private profit in blood. That is the second great possibility for liberalism, linked to the first. And thirdly, we may turn our present social necessities to the most enduring social reorganisation. With an absolute minimum of effort now, we may help to set going methods and machinery that will put the feeding and housing of the population and the administration of the land out of the reach of private greed and selfishness for ever. End of chapter 7 Recording by Peter Tomlinson Chapter 8 of The War That Will End War by Herbert George Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Tomlinson. Chapter 8. The Liberal Fear of Russia. It is evident that there is a very considerable dread of the power and intention of Russia in this country. It is well that the justification of this dread should be discussed now, for it is likely to affect the attitude of British and American liberalism very profoundly, both towards the continuation of the war and towards the ultimate settlement. It is, I believe, an exaggerated dread arising out of our extreme ignorance of Russian realities. English people imagine Russia to be more purposeful than she is, more concentrated, more inimical of Western civilization. They think of Russian policy as if it were a diabolically clever spider in a dark place. They imagine that the tremendous unification of state and national pride and ambition which has made the German Empire at last insupportable may presently be repeated upon an altogether more gigantic scale that pan-Slavism will take the place of pan-Germanism as the ruling aggression of the world. This is a dread due, I am convinced, to fundamental misconceptions and hasty parallelisms. Russia is not only the vastest country in the world, 
but the laxest. She is incapable of that tremendous unification. Not for two centuries yet, if ever, will it be necessary for a reasonably united Western Europe to trouble itself once Prussianism has been disposed of, about the risk of definite aggression from the East. I do not think it will ever have to trouble itself. Socially and politically, Russia is an entirely unique structure. It is the fashion to talk of Russia as being in the 14th century or in the 16th century. As a matter of fact, Russia, like everything else, is in the 20th century, and it is quite impossible to find in any other age a similar social organisation. In bulk, she is barbaric. Between 80 and 90 percent of her population is living at a level very little above the level of those agricultural Aryan races who were scattered over Europe before the beginning of written history. It is an illiterate population. It is superstitious in a primitive way, conservative and religious in a primitive way. It is incapable of protecting itself in the ordinary commerce of modern life. Against the business enterprise of better educated races, it has no weapon but a peasant's poor cunning. It is indeed a helpless, unawakened mass. Above these peasants come a few millions of fairly well-educated and actively intelligent people. They are all that corresponds in any way to a Western community such as ours. Either they are officials clerical or lay, in the great government machine that was consolidated chiefly by Peter the Great to control the souls and bodies of the peasant mass, or they are private persons more or less resentfully entangled in that machine. At the head of this structure, with powers of interference strictly determined by his individual capacity, is that tragic figure, the Tsar. That, briefly, is the composition of Russia, and it is unlike any other state on earth. It will follow laws of its own, and have a destiny of its own. Involved with the affairs of Russia are certain less barbaric states. There is Finland, which is by comparison highly civilised, and Poland, which is not nearly so far in advance of Russia. Both these countries are perpetually uneasy under the blundering pressure of foolish attempts to Russianize them. In addition, in the south and east are certain provinces thick with Jews, whom Russia can neither contrive to tolerate nor assimilate, who have no comprehensible projects for the help or reorganization of the country, and who deafen all the rest of Europe with their bitter, unhelpful tale of grievances so that it is difficult to realise how local and partial are their wrongs. There is a certain Russian idea containing within itself all the factors of failure, inspiring the general policy of this vast amorphous state. It found its completest expression in the works of the now defunct Pobedonostev, and it pervades the bureaucracy. It is obscurantist, denying the common people education. It is orthodox, forbidding free thought and preferring conformity to ability. It is bureaucratic and autocratic. It is pan-Slavic, Russianizing and aggressive. It is this Russian idea that Western liberalism dreads, and, as I want to point out, dreads unreasonably. I do not want to plead that it is not a bad thing. It is a bad thing. I want to point out that, unlike Prussianism, it is not a great danger to the world at large. So long as this Russian idea, this Russian Toryism, dominates Russian affairs, Russia can never be really formidable, either to India, to China, or to the liberal nations of Western Europe. And whenever she abandons this Toryism and becomes modern and formidable, she will cease to be aggressive. 
That is my case. While Russia has the will to oppress the world, she will never have the power. When she has the power, she will cease to have the will. Let me state my reasons for this belief as compactly as possible, because if I am right, a number of liberal-minded people in Great Britain and America and Scandinavia, who may collectively have a very great influence upon the settlement of Europe that will follow this war, are wrong. They may want to bolster up a really dangerous and evil Austria come Germany at the expense of France, Belgium and subject Slav populations because of their dread of this Russia which can never be at the same time evil and dangerous. Now, first let me point out what the Boer War showed and what this tremendous conflict in Belgium is already enforcing that the day of the unintelligent common soldier is past, that men who are animated and individualised can, under modern conditions, fight better than men who are unintelligent and obedient. Soldiering is becoming more specialised. It is calling for the intelligent handling of weapons so elaborate and destructive that great masses of men in the field are an encumbrance rather than a power. Battles must spread out, and leading give place to individual initiative. Consequently, Russia can only become powerful enough to overcome any highly civilised European country by raising its own average of education and initiative, and this it can only do by abandoning its obscurantist methods by liberalising upon the Western European model. That is to say, it will have to teach its population to read, to multiply its schools and increase its universities, and that will make an entirely different Russia from this one we fear. It involves a relaxation of a grip of orthodoxy, an alteration of the intellectual outlook of officialdom, an abandonment of quasi-religious autocracy, in short, the complete abandonment of the Russian idea as we know it. And it means also a great development of local self-consciousness. Russia seems homogeneous now because in the mass it is so ignorant as to be unaware of its differences. But an educated Russia means a Russia in which Ruthenian and Great Russian, Let and Tartar will be mutually critical and aware of one another. The existing Russian idea will need to give place to an entirely more democratic, tolerant and cosmopolitan idea of Russia as a whole, if Russia is to merge from its barbarism and remain united. There is no cheap Deutschland, Deutschland über alle sentiment ready-made to hand. National quality is against it. Patience under patriotism is a German weakness. Russians could no more go on singing and singing, Russia, Russia over all, than Englishmen could go on singing, Rule Britannia. It would bore them. The temperament of none of the Russian peoples justifies the belief that they will repeat, on a larger scale, even as much docility as the Germans have shown under the Prussians. No one who has seen the Russians who has had the opportunities of comparing Berlin with St. Petersburg or Moscow, or who knows anything of Russian art or Russian literature, will imagine this naturally wise, humorous and impatient people reduplicating the self-conscious, drill-dulled, soulless culture of Germany, or the political vulgarities of Potsdam. This is a terrible world, I admit, but Prussianism is the sort of thing that does not happen twice. Russia is substantially barbaric. Who can deny it? State stuff rather than a state. But people in Western Europe are constantly writing of Russia and the Russians as though the qualities natural to barbarism were qualities inherent in the Russian blood. Russia massacres sometimes even with official connivance. But Russia 
in all its history has no massacres so abominable as we gentle english were guilty of in ireland in the sixteenth and seventeenth centuries russia too russianizes sometimes clumsily sometimes rather successfully but germany has sought to germanize in bohemia and poland for instance with conspicuous violence and failure we anglicized ireland these forcible efforts to create uniformity are natural to a phase of social and political development from which no people on earth have yet fully emerged and if we set ourselves now to create a reunited poland under the russian crown if we bring all the great influence of the western powers to bear upon the side of the liberalizing forces in finland if we do not try to thwart and stifle russia by closing her legitimate outlet into the mediterranean we shall do infinitely more for human happiness than if we distrust her check her and force her back upon the barbarism from which with a sort of blind pathetic wisdom she seeks to emerge it is unfortunate for russia that she has come into conspicuous conflict with the jews she has certainly treated them no worse than she has treated her own people and she has treated them less atrociously than they were treated in england during the middle ages the jews by their particularism invite the resentment of all uncultivated humanity civilization and not revolt emancipates them and while russian reverses will throw back her civilization and intensify the sufferings of all her subject jews russian success in this alliance will inevitably spell westernization progress and amelioration for them but unhappily this does not seem to be patent to many jewish minds they have been embittered by their wrongs and in the english and still more in the american press a heavy weight of grievance against russia finds voice and distorts the issue of this while we are still only in the opening phase of this struggle for life against the prussianized german empire this struggle to escape from the militarism that has been slowly strangling civilization it is a huge misfortune that this racial resentment which great as it is is still a little thing beside the world issues involved should break the united front of western civilization and that the confidence of russia should be threatened as it is threatened now by doubt and disparagement in the press we are not so sure of victory that we can estrange an ally we have to make up our minds to see all poland reunited under the russian crown and if the turks choose to play a foolish part it is not for us to quarrel now about the fate of constantinople the allies are not to be tempted into a quarrel about constantinople the balance of power in the balkans that is to say incessant intrigue between austria and russia has arrested the civilization of southeastern europe for a century let it topple an unchallenged russia will be a wholesome check and no great danger for the new greater servia and the new greater rumania and the enlarged and restored bulgaria this war renders possible one civilized country only does russia really threaten and that country is sweden sweden has a vast wealth of coal and iron within reach of russia's hand and i confess i watch scandinavia with a certain terror during these days sweden is the only european country in which there is a pro-german militarist party and she may be tempted i do not know how strongly she may not have been tempted already to drag herself and norway into this struggle on the german side if she does our government will not be a little to blame for not having given her and induced russia to give her the strongest joint assurances and guarantees of her integrity for ever but if the scandinavian countries abstain from any participation in this present war then i do not see what is to prevent us and france and russia from making the most public definite and binding declaration of our common interest in sweden's integrity and our common determination to preserve it beyond that i see no danger to civilization in russia anywhere at least 
no danger so considerable as the Kaiser Krupp power we fight to finish. This war, even if it brings us the utmost success, will still leave Russia face to face with a united and chastened Germany. For it must be remembered that the downfall of Prussianism and the breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire will leave German Germany not smaller but larger than she is now. To India, decently governed and guarded, with an educational level higher than her own and three times her gross population, Russia can only be dangerous through the grossest misgovernment on our part, and her powers of intervention in China will be restricted for many years. But all our powers of intervention in China will be restricted for many years. A breathing space for Chinese reconstruction is one of the most immediate and least equivocal blessings of this war. Unless the Chinese are unteachable, and only stupid people suppose them a stupid race, the China of 1934 will not be a China for either us or Russia to meddle with. So where in all the world is this danger from Russia? The danger of a Krupp cum Kaiser dominance of the whole world on the other hand, is immediate. Defeat or even a partial victory for the Allies means nothing less than that. End of chapter 8 Recording by Peter Tomlinson